Okay, and uh, again, I'm really happy about this. Um, and uh, Michael Araki was responsible for this panel, and you can see the stellar uh, panelists that we have. And I want to thank Michael both for preparing this uh, and arranging this panel, but also uh, he has been kind of an external conference planner for us. He's been very helpful in a number of different ways. So I want to make sure that I express my appreciation both for the panel, but also his other contributions. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, Michael, and since he put this all together, I'm going to let him do the other introduction. So welcome, and Michael, take it away. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for your presence. Well, uh, I, I planned this um, panel in a way to be very meta. So it's about polymathy. If you don't know, polymathy is about acquiring expertise, knowledge, and doing that in multiple domains and creating with this knowledge that's broad, that's profound, and integrated. And the idea here is to bring uh, experts to look at this very rich, very broad concept in very different and unique ways with unique methods. So my task here is very easy. It's just to introduce the topic and let them speak and show their amazing results on this uh, construct. There is a clicker here. Okay, so, uh, when we think about polymathy and those people that are first introduced to the concept, always think of Leonardo da Vinci, the ultimate Renaissance man. But what I would like to do, in fact, is to dispel the notion that polymathy is Leonardo da Vinci. Polymathy is something, and I will try to convince you, that goes pretty much beyond this uh, Renaissance period, and we have this word re Renaissance person to refer to polymathy. No, polymathy is such an old ancient word, word that has been with us since the dawn of human, uh, of Western at least, civilization. It's a 2,500 year old term. And some people come to me, why don't you use interdisciplinarity or multipotentiality or something else? Like, come, come on, we have seniority here, so this word is much more ancient. Your word is new, not mine. <laughs> and it's not even mine, of course. It's, oh, by the way, who is the corner of this, coiner of this word? As far as we know, it was Heraclitus. Americans sometimes pronounce Heraclitus. And I have an interesting story about his, his rivalry with Pythagoras, another father of uh, our Western society. Okay, so the first thing, all right, Leonardo is very nice, but polymathy is not Leonardo. It has philosophical underpinnings. And if you're not convinced, I brought a philosopher, okay? This guy is a very interesting figure, Albert Camus. And in his myth of Sisyphus, he had one thing in mind. He wanted to also dispel the notions of other philosophers that there is an ultimate external truth or ultimate external meaning for life. So before the existentialists, as they are called, each philosopher tried to come up with a solution of how to understand or how to make meaning of our short trip in this ephemeral island of existence. And what Albert Camus said, okay, you think that life is like that? You think that this is the meaning of life? You were wrong. And then he goes to another philosopher. And then Kant said that, all right, but he is wrong. <laughs> and then he goes one by one, destroying the notion that there could be an external ultimate truth in which we could grasp on to understand and to live our lives. And even though he comes to the conclusion that life is absurd, there is no external truth, so what to do with our lives? And then he comes with this very beautiful moment 
when after talking about this absurdity of existence, he says, our, our, he means, the person who understands the absurdity. We, us, the person that has faced this need of, uh, of meaning and reality comes with emptiness. So that's the nature of the absurd. What to do with that? So our effort in this ephemeral island of his existence is to examine, to enlarge, and to enrich our lives. But first, we need to know. So I hope <laughs> you are convinced there is philosophy behind that. And it's not only Albert Camus, another great forefather of uh, human thought and education, uh, one of the most important figures in Germany, uh, Wilhelm Humboldt, has brought this very, very beautiful uh, extract here. So, what's the ultimate task of our existence? It still requires much substance. It's not only experiences in a shallow way, it's substance, it's something that can be meaningful, but not only acquisition of substance. It's not only what I'm going to say or call passive polymathy. It's a linkage of the self. And the self is already very, very complex, as we know <laughs> as psychologists, right? And how could we live a better, fuller life by integrating our complexity with the complexity of the world and to generate novelty and to enrich culture in the most general, most animated, and most unrestrained, that's a key word, interplay. All right, enough with the philosophy, let's go with the more scientific stuff and what people always talk to me, and I said to my supervisor in my master's degree, oh, I would like to, uh, uh, to explore this concept of polymathy. All right, Michael, do you have an operational definition? Do you have a way to measure that? First question. And I said, all right, I don't, but nobody else in the world seems to have it as well. <laughs> so let's try to make it work a little bit better. Well, in my understanding, uh, polymathy, of course, is about breadth. You cannot be a narrow specialist. You can also, or you should not also be uh, superficial. If you are superficial, you're gonna have a dilettante, a person who goes, flies around in many areas, but doesn't really engage their psyche on these experiences. So you need the substance, which is depth. And in the middle of this idea is integration, which happens at three levels. The integration of ideas that we have been talking about here many, many times. We need combinations of concepts to arrive at something new. And for that, we cannot be using the same concepts as everybody else in the field. If you are using the same raw materials, like the Lego here, for example, you have a very limited, a very strained uh, set of possibilities. But that's only one part of integration. The second part, and that comes a lot from the work of Robert Ruth Bernstein, is what I call the integration of a personality, which is you have these multiple interests, you have perhaps multiple abilities, but some people, they live schizophrenic lives. So in some, uh, co uh, in some social parts, they, they have to show only one part of themselves, and in other uh, environment, only another part. So this is very, I say, schizoid. This is very fragmented. And finally, the integration of the self, of the ideas that are formulated here with the, the ideas that are going on on humankind, on our culture. Okay, I have this provisional definition. I just put here, because I'm gonna send you the slides later, <laughs> not gonna read it. Uh, okay, one very important thing. Since we are having very different approaches here, it's very, very important to define the different understanding, understandings of polymathy. After all, it's a 
five year, well, 500 year old concept. It cannot remain the same throughout the course of humanity. So, for example, Simonton talks more about the big C polymathy. Remember the pro C big C differentiation from Kaufman and Bigero? I just borrowed that. Uh, Robert and Michelle talk about avocation of polymathy and the mixing between vocations and avocations, uh, one informing another, and there is no clear cut differentiation when something is your avocation and then vocation. Is that when you get more money from one and not for another? And then if it changes, if it's 49, 51, it, and it flips, you're not avocational, you're now professional, doesn't make sense, right? And historians that came first, historians and philologists, they came first, and they generally uh, talk about passive polymathy, which has more to do with the idea that was presented in the Renaissance. And this is my model, just to show you how these different types would fit in two dimensions. Okay, I'm gonna go very fast here. And I have some very interesting stories about that. So, as I told you, Heraclitus, this guy here, was a coiner of the term polymathy. And he had a very interesting rivalry with Pythagoras, which we know by his famous or infamous theorem of how to calculate the hypotenuse of a tri triangle. And the thing is, Pythagoras didn't have a school, he had a sect, he had a religion, in fact. So everybody who subscribed to his school should also su subscribe to his way of living. And of course, Heraclitus was a very empirical guy, and he said, come on, this guy just traveled to Egypt, just traveled to the Far East, and brought things from there. He's not a knowledge creator. He is an adjudicator of knowledge. I don't like that. I like things that I can see, that I can understand, that I can uh, 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 use my senses to get it. So this is a very old dichotomy. That's not new, empiricists and a prioristic thinkers. But we have this division within Pythagoras' sect of the Acousmatici and Mathematici. These guys here were the people, the leaders and politicians who did not have the time to be philosophers. So they just repeated, listened to the lessons. And those guys here were the researchers of that time. They sought mathema, precision, which is in Greek is called akribeia, precise notions. The evolution of mathematics and precise finesse uh, ended up with the equation of mathema being equated with, as we know today, as mathematics, the most precision way of conveying an idea. All right, and then we go to the Renaissance period, and this is the first a uh, non-published book on polymathy by Johannes Wover in early Prussia. And polymathy for them is not knowing everything. It's knowing the qualified knowledge of the liberal arts of that time, which is the trivium and quadrivium, which e every child knows at school today. All right? That's geometry, mathematics astronomy at least basic concepts so that was polymathy for them okay which was never universal knowledge this is our own concept it was understanding that and being prepared to understand the world via inquisition and peregrination via traveling via experiences substantial experiences all right and then we come to the modern times and we see this crack in society we see the world getting more and more complex, more and more volatile, ambiguous, noisy, what to do with our lives. And people were seeking polymathy as a philosophy of life, going back to the Greeks, going back to the Renaissance period to get meaning and going back to Albert Camus. Camus. When it gets absurd, you go to knowledge. You are living in an ephemeral island. All right, but what you do with that? Acquire substance, the more you can, of course. Okay, so we have modern day research on polymathy. Those guys here are very important. Robert Ruth Bernstein, Kaufman and Bigero, uh, 
Scott Perry Kaufman had an imagination retreat to talk about polymathy two years ago. One year, uh, two years ago, uh, Peter Burke, very good historian, talked about polymath in a very interesting way, brings a very interesting historical perspective to us. And then we have uh, new guys talking about the genes and biological underpinnings of polymathy. And we have Angela Cotelesa's first phenomenological study on, about polymaths. And the future, we see that there is a gap and we are living and we are suffering from this gap of knowledge. And remember C.P. Snow's talk in 1959 about the two cultures. The more we have the gap between different cultures, the more difficult it is to solve complex wicked problems. So we need polymaths to solve that. And there is a very uh, famous Brazilian author that I like very much. He died, passed away uh, a few years ago. And he said, Leonardo da Vinci would never be recognized by our organizations. What's wrong? Who is wrong? Leonardo, the polymaths, or the organizations? Okay, let's think about it. And we have the Grand Watch Turn, which is the police frontier. So you are all in departments. Funding go to boxes in departments. If you do not fit in a box in a department, you are not funded. You are not going to do your research. Who is wrong? We or them? Anyway, so what I'm doing now, I have four different uh, lines of research, main lines of research. I just finished my last version of the trade polymathic questionnaire, uh, which was validated against the temperamental approach. I'm not going to have time to talk about this. I will talk about that after lunch at 1 o'clock. This is my model, 2018 article, published in the Journal of Genius and Eminence added by Mark Rumpel. I have this my model of creativity, which is complex, and now <laughs> I have to... There is a very short story about that, okay? I'm trained in uh, finance as well. And then I learned this thing here, which is called the stochastic processes. And then I was taking a shower one day and uh, thinking about polymathy and creativity problems, and I said, well, everybody uses combinatorial approach, but there is like, how do they model randomness? And then, oh, I just learned that. Stochastic processes. I'm going to do that. I'm pretty sure nobody has thought of that. But I was like clear cut sure that nobody could think about that. But just to ease my consciousness, I googled stochastic processes and creativity. And there comes <laughs> Not to go by DK Simonton. <laughs> I was, oh my god, I don't believe it. I got pissed first <laughs> until I read the article. Oh, it makes sense. And then there are some things that I'm still not uh, uh, satisfied. <laughs> I want to, to try to use this to, to help advance. It, uh, long story short, instead of three parameters that Simonton has, I have five. Uh, the final idea, the initial position of the idea, the drift, this is like the zeitgeist. So everybody starts more or less equal, and everybody's going to this direction. Like every, every path here is a thought stream, is a train of thinking by a scientist. The scientist is crazy. This is crazy, but he, <laughs> he was kicked out of his idea. So that's a different way of seeing the very same idea. And I believe in, in, in uh, uh, blind variation, selective variation, but I also believe in insights. So this model could bring up, perhaps all those two together and to finish a lot of new and different ways that organizations are rethinking them to better acknowledge, to better bring and retain and foster polymathy and polymathic people. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Angela Cotalesa, and I want to start with a quick story. So when I was 18 years old, I moved from the San Francisco Bay Area to LA and I went to the University of Southern California. By chance, I signed up for a freshman seminar that met once a week. It was taught by a theater professor. 
It was called Self-Expression and the Arts, was the name of the seminar. He created a competition called the Culture Vulture Competition. And the idea was we'd come to the seminar every week, we'd go around the table, and every person would just share something or multiple things that they had tried that week that were new. Having grown up in quite a bubble <laughs> in the Bay Area, it was very easy for me to find lots of things that were new. And I have a bit of a competitive streak, and I ended up winning that competition because there were so many new things for me to try. And it sparked something in me. It sparked something in me. That was 1999 that I have never been able to let go of. And I, it, it instilled in me a desire to try and experience life as fully and as broadly as I possibly could. And fast forward to 2015, I entered a doctoral program at George Washington University. Of course, began thinking, what do I want to do my dissertation on? So many professors said, pick something you're really passionate about. It's not easy to do research and basically write a book. And so, though I didn't even know the word polymath at that time, I felt like, I want to write about this thing, about being a Renaissance woman, about being kind of all in at life and being open to life. And so, I did it. And along the way, I ended up finding this word polymath. Just out of curiosity, how many of you before Creativity Conference 2019 knew the word polymath? knew what it meant. Wow, oh. that's pretty impressive. Most people I talk to <laughs> go, what? I've never heard of that. It's booming. Um, so as Michael yeah. said, you know, uh, and Michael talked about the meaning, but I, I want to say that this, I want to do a little bit of recruiting, if you don't mind. This is a field that's um, quite small, and most of the people who have written on polymathy are here this weekend. There's really just a handful of us. So if this is something you're interested in, please join the scholarly conversation and consider doing research and thought leadership on polymathy because it, it needs more attention, it deserves more attention. I also want to say subjectivity statement right up front. I think being polymathic is a great way to be at life. So I have some bias because I think it's good. So in my research, that was in my dissertation, uh, I have a positive uh, bent towards polymathy. And uh, I did try to be as, you know, neutral let the participants speak for themselves but um, part of why this is important is because the difficult problems of our time are not easily solved within one silo or one discipline if you think of something like global warming yes it's a technical uh, a technical scientific problem but it's also a human problem it's also a communications problem and a marketing problem so we need people who can build bridges between disciplines to solve the difficult problems of our time all right, so a few monikers for polymathy, um, you know, of course, Renaissance man, polyhistor, Emily Wapnick calls it multi-potentialite, um, people with multi-creative potential. But the idea is that you're not a specialist. You're not narrow professionally and uh, perhaps not, not narrow in your avocations or your hobbies either. The trouble is we really don't, don't know a whole lot about polymaths as a whole. Certainly individual polymaths have been studied, um, but we don't know how, you know, how do polymaths come to be that way? What helped them become polymathic? What, what impediments do, do they face in being that way in modern society? And how do they overcome those impediments? How can organizations utilize their talent and leverage it and kind of take humanity to the next level? And how can we support polymaths to create um, or, or to make the greatest contributions possible. So I wrote a dissertation on it to try to understand, um, oh, sorry, let me go back here. Problems, okay, a few quick problems. So we don't know much about modern day polymaths, even though certainly they can be very valuable for organizations and societies. There are few incentives for people to become multidisciplinary experts. In fact, there's quite a few disincentives um, and then, you know, we could definitely benefit from more polymaths, but we don't even know how to foster their development. So, hence my dissertation and my research questions. So these were my questions. What is the lived experience of, of polymaths? What is it like being a polymath? How does it feel? How does polymathy impact creativity and creative problem solving? That's particularly relevant for you all. How did polymaths come to be? How did polymaths discover that they're a polymath? And, and what in their environment impacted them becoming a polymath? So those were my guiding questions. 
I did a phenomenological study. I interviewed 13 people, uh, highly accomplished polymaths, and analyzed the data. Poly, uh, sorry, phenomenology is, the purpose of phenomenology is to understand lived experience. So in the interviews, I covered their life history, the details of the experience of being polymathic, and the meaning making that they made around being polymaths, and that's per Seidman 2013. At the end of the day, I ended up with about 500 pages of interview transcripts and took raw data, took what is called the horizons, or it's, I, I kind of call it the meat of the interviews, the, the actual statements that mean something, that have valuable information. And then I grouped those statements into clusters of meaning, broad heading, and then subheadings, uh, major and minor themes, using a code book structure. And um, for example, under you know being a polymath impacts social experiences. That was a very common theme I got. Sub themes include included uh, bullying, discouragers, obstacles, independent spirit, people skills, polymath community. So those were the invariant themes. Is this too nerdy? I'm getting <laughs> quite quite a bit of the weeds. Um, so I used Mustakas' 1994 data analysis methods which led then to individual and composite textual descriptions, which means the what, the fine grain of individual experiences, and that those were laid out in writing. And then also the, the individual and composite structural descriptions, which explains the how, like the family and the finances, and sort of the scaffolding around their experience that helped them become polymathic. And then together, all of that, I wrote a, a statement about the essence of polymath experience. Um, by the way, I'm going to put a link to my dissertation in the notes or the comments for this talk if you'd like to peruse it. All right, let's talk about the sample. So I used snowball sampling. I have, had a couple different snowballs. Uh, a number of participants were not interviewed because they didn't meet the criteria. Um, roughly, I mean, participants had to, to identify and be able to claim, yes, I am polymathic, I'm not a specialist. Some of them felt comfortable with that word. Some, some of them liked other words that meant a similar thing. They had to have significant experience and expertise in both the arts and the sciences. They had to have at least two unrelated uh, career paths in those areas. Uh, roughly the demographics, the age range of actual participants was 30 to 56. They had to have native English fluency. Not all of them had English as a, a first language, but they could speak fluent English, which uh, I needed because that's the only language I'm fluent in, so that's a limitation of the study. There were seven uh, females, six males, ten Americans, and three Europeans. Overall, I mean, I can't give away their identities because that was George Washington University's rules uh, to pr protect my human subjects, but overall they were a very, very highly accomplished group of people, uh, published authors, TED talkers, uh, the uh, highly, highly impressive people, people with podcasts. Um, they were movers and shakers, I guess you could say. So cause some key themes, there's not, not conclusions, just sort of themes that the data showed me. So in terms of how did they get to be that way, their development, financial resources and family upbringing can both hinder and promote polymathy. And this is a really interesting point. For some people, having financial resources helped promote their polymathy because it meant I can go to school and I can travel and I can take fun classes and workshops and stuff. And then for others, not having resources financially meant I can't outsource tiling my bathroom, so I have to figure it out myself. Um, and so, and that's just a, a, a rough example, but the idea is for some people, not having financial resources force them to learn more and become broader and more polymathic. And for others, having money helped them explore and try. So that, that could go both ways. And the same was true of families. Having very supportive parents who, who let them explore and try lots of things in a supportive kind of way could lead them to becoming polymathic. Or having a sort of dysfunctional household for some of them meant I need to get a ticket out, I need to get skills, and so, so kind of difficult and traumatic childhoods might have pushed them to become polymathic, to have a larger toolkit to navigate through life and get out of maybe a difficult situation. So I think those are some interesting uh, themes I found. 
I asked all the participants if they thought their polymathy was due to nature or nurture, and I got you know a mix of both. So it's probably, at least from their perspective, both. But definitely what I heard from them is that to, to be polymathic and have a level of achievement and excellence, it definitely took effort and attention. Career. So I also heard polymaths, you know, they define themselves as highly creative experts across disparate disciplines. They have difficulty making career choices because the way organizations are set up, they want you to pick one thing, be a specialist, and that's how you're successful. Polymaths don't want to be specialists. Or maybe they start as a specialist, but they want to be broader and become specialists in multiple fields, which organizations tend to discriminate against that if they see it on a resume and they move to the next person who's been more committed to one field. Um, and I heard from my participants that they, they really just can't be happy as narrow specialists. It's, it's just, they don't like it. They don't want to do that. Um, social identity. Polymath identity emerges from not, not fitting in the box. This was a sort of interesting theme. Social identity theory says that the way people um, develop their identity or their, their self-concept as a person is derived from perceived membership in relevant social groups. So I identify with women, with being Caucasian, with being American, with having a doctorate. That all makes sense, right? And the same way, you know, you guys could, I'm sure, come up with your own groups that you identify with. But what I heard from polymaths is, I realized I was a polymath because I didn't really fit in with any group. And so this was also really interesting finding and maybe an addendum to social identity theory that maybe there are some groups that get their identity because they can't find a group to be in. Um, imposter syndrome, oh sorry, being polymathic impacts their social experience, of course. And polymaths are quite confident. They seem confident. They, they do brave things. They, they're very open to experiences. But then this thing called imposter syndrome, I didn't ask about it, but it came up in so many of my interviews that because they haven't dedicated their, their lives to one field, that when they talk to specialists, they sort of do feel like an imposter. And so that was interesting. Um, other characteristics, they're voracious learners. Polymathy and learning, learning cannot be separated. And um, effective polymaths are effective time managers. They, they juggle a lot. OK, my conclusions. So back, I'm going to state my research questions, and then the conclusions are kind of the answers to those research questions. So the first question was, what is the lived experience of polymaths? The conclusion was, to be a polymath, one must accept not fitting in a box, and perhaps even, and by the way, this box thing kept, came up in a ton of my interviews thinking outside the box, being outside, like that was the sort of analogy I heard from them. So, so they have to accept not fitting in a box and sort of embodying what seems like contradictions. And polymathy is being intrapersonally diverse. By the way, I hope you take that away uh, as a takeaway thought of this idea of intrapersonal diversity. When we think of diversity, conversations around diversity are important. They exist at the meso and macro levels not at the micro level of analysis. And one of the contributions that I hope my dissertation made is pointing out that diversity can exist within one person by being a polymath. It already does exist, as has been talked about in the literature, in the gut microbiome. People with more intrapersonal diversity in the gut microbiome are, are healthier. But I think it also exists outside the gut in other ways within the humans. So the concept of diversity needs to become more diversified itself. All right, um, what is it like being a polymath? Polymaths are exposed broadly, think creatively and strategically, and are effective time managers. How does it feel to be a polymath? Being a polymath can make life richer, but it can also be quite difficult, and that's mostly because of the societal context that is not very um, kind to people who are polymaths, at least not yet. How does polymathy impact creativity and creative problem solving? This is of particular interest to you guys, I'm sure. So polymaths are self-reported, uh, excellent at solving problems creatively. And I want to read a quote from someone called, her, her pseudonym is Wendy in my dissertation. Highly, highly accomplished person. She said, and I quote, my polymathy allows me to play the best card in my hand, right? Depending on what the situation is. It certainly gives me a larger hand of cards, if we're extending this analogy, in the, you know, if the tools that I learned in business school aren't really working in this particular situation, 
I can go pull something out of my classical music training, or I can go look at my mathematical skill set or coding skill set and be like, well, is there an analogy or a framework or an approach um, to uh, make diagonal association and connection that just gives, and that just gives me a larger kind of toolkit to work off of than someone who has only pursued one path. The toolkit I bring to any kind of problem solving situation is quite a bit larger than usually the other people in the room. Creative problem solving is probably one of the things that I do best. End quote. All right. So I, I just want to emphasize that last point that if you're see, if you want to encourage creativity, encourage, think about polymathy as path to that. Okay, I gotta hurry up. Um, what is the lived experience? Oh, sorry. How did polymaths come to be? Um, nature, nurture, self-directed learning. How did polymaths discover their identity? I, I touched upon this already. They discover their identity of polymaths because they don't fit in in any other box. Or, or bo they don't fit in, so they realize I'm different in this way. And then what in a polymath environment impacted them becoming a polymath? Family and financial resources. And I already touched upon that as well. Some, uh, I've got some recommendations. Encourage the development of more interdisciplinary expert scholars, please. <laughs> Broaden conceptions around what types of human diversity exist. I already talked about that. Broaden conceptions around what intrapersonal diversity means. And organizations really got to figure this out. If they can figure out this puzzle, where polymaths make sense, how to unleash their creativity, it can really take organizations to the next level. It can take humanity to the next level. They have no clue. In fact, most people, uh, participants I talked to felt organizations have no idea how to use their skill set or leverage it. Many of them become entrepreneurs because they're so frustrated by the way organizations treat them. Um, some ideas about future of polymathy scholarship. Hint, hint, come on guys. So <laughs> study the relationship between polymaths and leadership, genetic factors, cultures or educational systems in polymathy how organi organizational leaders can leverage the talents of polymaths more. Um, I'm going to skip through, so, but and the slides will be available. I'm going to end with this quote, a mind that is stretched by new experiences can never go back to its old dimensions. So I encourage you all to keep this on your mind. Stay abreast with what's going on in the field. Maybe join us. And if you'd like to check out my website, um, it's lessoncollector.com, and I've got a Facebook group called Polymath Place as well, if you'd like to check it out. And I think my time's up. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Uh, DK Simonson's up next. You'll, you'll notice something that. Um, I don't know if we talk about versatility, but um, as far as presentations go, I'm going to be the least versatile person here. <laughs> I have absolutely no figures, no drawings, nothing. It's all going to be just plain you black you text. On you you oh, oh. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, just plain black text on, on, on a white field, and as if I'm typing it or something like that. Okay, but I'm also going to be talking about a different topic that's highly related to polymathy, and that is versatility. In fact, polymathy is a subset, as we'll see, of um, versatility. Um, and I'm also going to be taking a, uh, his a uh, histometric approach. Uh, most of my research uses histeriometry, which means the quantitative analysis of historical and biographical uh, information, fitting models, uh, to actual collected data, quantified data. Um, and a lot of times I'm studying samples that include all the major polymaths. Uh, I have uh, Leonardo da Vinci. I have studies where I've studied Leonardo da Vinci as part of a larger sample, uh, Goethe, and so forth. All right. I'm actually going to mention five empirical studies that use histometric methods that are spread over a, a pretty large period from 1936 to 2010. Uh, two studies are based on Cox. How many are familiar with Catherine Cox's study of 301 geniuses? It's in the uh, term of genetic studies of genius. It's volume two. Uh, but it's very different because all the other volumes study these uh, little kids that have high IQs, and her studies true, honest, goodness geniuses and estimates their IQ. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk two studies based on that, including one I did in 1976. Then I'll briefly talk about Frank Sullivan. How many are familiar with Frank Sullivan's work on birth order and, and reception of scientific innovations? Okay. Uh, and then I'll talk about two Cassandra studies. Cassandra was one of my graduate students. Um, actually, both of these studies are his. The only reason why I have my name attached to it is he decided to leave academy, uh, academia and use the mathematical and statistical skills he learned with me to be, uh, be, uh, work for the Arizona Diamondbacks uh, as a cybermetrician. <laughs> and he made a lot more money. <laughs> OK. So uh, what happened here is I basically just wrote up his dissertation and tacked my name at the end for writing it up. But he did all the work. OK. Let's get started with the basic definitions. Um, we have versatility is a more broad concept, as I mentioned before. Uh, these are interests and abilities in more than one domain or subdomain, where a domain is like science, literature, philosophy, et cetera, and where a subdomain is like poetry, drama, fiction, within literature. So like Shakespeare was both a dramatist and a, a poet, for example. Um, presumably, interests are prior to and enhance lower than abilities. Uh, you know, you have to have an interest usually before you can develop a competence in the field. You have to take some time. So we may have heard of the 10 year, a year rule where it takes a while to acquire world class uh, competence, expertise in an area. Um, however, most of these, both interests and abilities, obviously, admit of degrees. Okay. Polymathy is the subset of versatility where we're talking about actual achieve eminence in more than one domain or subdomain, um, where I would say the former uh, indicates greater polymathy than latter. That is, if you have achieved eminence in, in two or more domains, then that's a higher level of polymathy than achieving in two subdomains. Okay, so Sh Shakespeare was a low-level polymath because he was only a dramatist and a, and a poet. Okay, <laughs> he should have done some scientific study at some time or another, but he, but he didn't. Um, and then uh, achieved eminence also, of course, admits of degrees. So in the case of Goethe, who is obvious uh, a polymath. His literary achievements surpass his scientific achievements. In fact, a lot of people don't even know that he has some scientific achievements. I mentioned in, uh, in discussion uh, on the first day um, on a talk that uh, Greg Feist did that Goethe actually thought that his greatest achievement was his theory of colors, his scientific work. You know what I mean? He thought that was superior to Faust. Crazy. <laughs> And maybe he was right. I don't know. I, I happen to prefer Faust to the theory of colors. By the way, if you don't know it, he was attacking Newton's optics, saying it was totally wrong. There's no such thing as white. OK. Um, OK, I start off with uh, Cox's early mental traits of uh, 300 geniuses. Uh, and I just give you a little background. Like I said before, this is volume two of genetic studies. There's 301 of the most eminent creators and leaders in Western history that are born between 1450 and 1850. So actually, Leonardo da Vinci was born in 1452 as the earliest uh, member of the sample. Um, the rank eminent scores were based on Cattell, which was also the source of the sample. He looked at how, many different, how much space was devoted to these people in various biographical dictionaries uh, written in um, English, um, Italian, German and French. Um, he ha she had multiple raters calculate IQ scores. Um, and they deposit the raw biographical data in, trans in TypeScript at the German archive, which I actually went to. Stanford's not far enough, far from where I work at UC Davis. And uh, she also has uh, data abstracts. In this dissertation, this is a doctoral dissertation. That's 842 pages <laughs> long in print, not TypeScript, in print. Pretty intimidating. Um, OK, this is an interesting study done just uh, five years after she pub uh, published her dissertation. Um, it's done by a white. 
But it, this is an interesting thing about the politics of graduate school education. Why was a second year graduate student at Stanford looking for some research topics? He ran into Lewis Terman, and Lewis Terman said, I have a project for you to do. And then he directed him on what to do. Just told him, do this, do that, do the other thing. And then he got a public publisher for it. But Terman took his name off the paper. Okay. So it looked like it was White's thing. And by the way, White shows signs that he resented this terribly. He was thinking of somewhere he would have more control over his, his this is actually his first publication. And by the way, White went on into a totally different field and became famous for the study, uh, uh, study of peace research. And there's actually a major peace award by the Peace Division of American Psychological Association that's named the Ralph White, uh, White Award. And that's because of his negative reaction to Terman. <laughs> All he can think about is war. <laughs> okay. Um, and he actually consulted uh, Catherine Cox uh, on the study. She by that time had married, so it became Cox Miles. This is something I've never been able to understand. He says the N is 300. Her sample was 301. I cannot figure out who was missing. But some data set ended up under the report. I'm going to have to go through this pretty fast. Okay. Um, anyway, he used an ordinal scale from minus 5 to plus 5, with 0 indicating that uh, average, uh, average college student. Uh, he found that positive scores were more common than negative scores, which you know, sort of makes sense. Although there were negative scores. There were some polymaths uh, in, the, in this sample who, who scored negatively in certain areas. Like they absolutely hated music, or they hated mathematics. Uh, ability items more common than, than interest items. Uh, soldiers, artists, and musicians were significantly lower in uh, versatility than in other groups. And he also found that uh, versatility cluster. You had a scientific cluster, literary cluster, uh, scholastic cluster, and administrative cluster. So for example, <clears throat> for example, literature was poetry, novels, and drama. So Shakespeare should have written a, a novel, but he didn't. Okay. And here's some examples of, of the polymaths with Goethe in all of his major areas, and of course Benjamin Franklin. Uh, the second study was done like by me. Um, it uses all for 301, instead of just 300. Uh, I'm not gonna go, I'm gonna skip some of this stuff, but the way I calculated polymathy is they got one point for being two domains and only half point for being um, within a domain. Um, and the interesting thing is I found that there was a fairly high degree of, of versatility, that, that the, the average was about 0.61, indicating that there were a large number of people who contributed at least to uh, two subdomains. Uh, it, it turns out that um, polymathy correlated with their eminence, 0.23. It also correlated with their estimated IQ. It correlated slightly with their formal education. Okay. Uh, however, I have to point out that the correlation between versatility and rank eminence was stronger for the leaders than for the um, uh, creators. And I think it's because I, I did too much lumping. Because we already said that, uh, for example, the positions have very low um, versatility. Okay. Uh, Soloway, born to the rebel, he has a really interesting footnote hidden uh, on, on page 481. Uh, note where we actually look at the relationship between um, how many domains a scientist contributes to and their eminence. And what's interesting, it is overall a positive relationship, but it's also curvilinear. It's a J-curve. So what that means is if you want to become a really, really eminent scientist, then you should be a polymath, be highly versatile, like an Isaac Newton or a Leibniz. Okay. But if that's too much of a strain, then just focus on one single thing only, okay? And then you'll be more eminent than somebody in between. So there's two alternative strategies. But polymathy is the better of the two strategies, okay? Now the Cassandra studies. Um, the first one, he looked at over 2,000 historical craters. These are all people who had biographical entries in uh, successive editions of um, Encyclopedia Britannica, 
they uh, span a, a very large historical period. Um, and of course, they only select those that had reliable uh, data. All right. And the more interesting, most interesting thing here is he actually calculated versatility, a non versatility, intra versatile, and inter. This is intra field versatility and uh, inter field versatility. And what I think is interesting is versatility is actually fairly common. Um, I mean, I'll, sure, 61% uh, are non versatile, but you have 15% um, who are intra versatile and 24%, which is almost one quarter, who are. Um, major contributors to two different domains. Yeah, and we're talking about achieving eminence in this case. All right. Um, and then the second study is an interesting one where he took a sample of authors who contributed to the great books of the Western world. Something I've been reading since high school, believe it or not. And um, he measured them on um, their versatility. And I'll show you how it was amazing. Their openness to experience, okay, and uh, their topical diversity. Actually, you analyze their creative products to see how many different topics they dealt with, okay. And um, this is the uh, scale they use. The first two assess on a ten-point scale. This is the greatest measure of versatility ever published in the history of the field. Because it measures it multiple ways, okay? For example, one of the ways, so how many of you familiar with Howard Gardner's uh, multiple intelligence? It's almost everybody, right? And he had seven and eight, and you know, it increases over time. At this time, it was seven, because it's based on uh, Howard, Howard's uh, 1993 uh, book. But you know, he gave one point for each of the intelligence that was demonstrated. So there's multiple ways of measuring it. He measured it both in terms of just whether or not a person had that as an avocation, but also whether or not they achieved eminence. And guess what? He found out it really didn't make any difference how you measured it, that um, it, it turns out that the reliability of this composite, the 10 iron composite, using alternative definition, including the one I used in my 1976 paper, has a reliability of 0.91. So these tend to agree. Somebody who is polymathic or versatile by one measure will be polymathic or versatile by another measure. So let's don't quibble here, okay? Measure openness experience using an observer-based version of the NEO, okay, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Unfortunately, the reliability wasn't very high. And then topical diversity was used in the great uh, books in the topic on, which looks at uh, 102 major themes in Western civilization. He did all sorts of crazy. Remember, he ended up being a cybermetrician for the Arizona Diamondbacks. So he did a lot of very fancy analyses. I won't go into all the detail, uh, correction, whatever. But this is the final result. Um, here we have top diversity. Here we have versatility. Here we have openness. And uh, like I said, the openness, forget it. I mean, it, did, it does correlate with top of diversity. The more o higher the openness, the more different topics the person will deal with in their published work, which makes sense. Um, and top of diversity correlates with versatility, no matter what measure you use. It's just unfortunate that openness didn't correlate with versatility. That was a, one of the hypotheses that didn't pan out. OK. Conclusions. I'm actually going to finish this. <laughs> remember, remember my keynote, I was trying to beat the wrap up. <laughs> I'm very close, I know. Okay, using uh, histometric methods, both versatility and polymathic can be assessed in creative geniuses of the highest order. We're talking about the exemplars of the phenomena we're talking about, uh, at least in the Western civilization. Um, and these assessments feature relationships with other individual differences, including achieved eminence, estimated IQ, formal education, top of diversity, and primary domain of achievement. I want to see more research more histometric research on these great geniuses like Leonardo da Vinci. Thank you.
Hi everybody. Uh, my talk will be related to neuroscience, and uh, I'm going to use a model that we presented yesterday. I'm not going to stay on this model too much. As a printout slide is there on the back. If you want to take a second to just uh, take it, it's for people who didn't uh, attend yesterday. Okay. Now, okay. Uh, did Did you hear what I just said? No. No. Okay. So basically what I said that uh, uh, my talk relates to neuroscience and the uh, print out the slide related to neuroscience is positioned over there on the table for those people who didn't attend yesterday my talk. Anyway, um, so, wonderful. so this is a slide that printed out. As you see, it's rather busy. And if you have any questions, uh, more specific questions about uh, neuroscience behind it, um, I, I wouldn't distribute it because some people already uh, used it, um, so it's all right. Um, and uh, it's a, a little bit uh, fuzzy kind of neurochemistry. Trust me, this is a result of many decades of multidisciplinary conceptual analysis and consultations with specialists. Um, however, uh, the, despite of the fact that it's kind of complex and messy, uh, we suggest that uh, this gives you the power to uh, generate taxonomies of psychiatric disorders and psychological individual differences, including creativity and cognitive. The idea is that uh, we can structure individual differences in our behavior in a very systemic way, thinking about that uh, behavior is always about expanding the alternatives, behavioral alternatives, such as cognitive, perceptual alternatives, uh, motor actions alternatives, and any other creativity alternatives. Then choice of alternatives, again, we have individual differences uh, on this parameter. And uh, uh, let's say energetic capacities to sustain chosen program. And uh, uh, these aspects are regulated differently for wider context, and that's where polymacy comes from, uh, wider context of reality when uh, people regulate their behavior in terms of uh, a variety of uh, settings. Then, uh, in social context, meaning peer level, the same level of systems, internal uh, context when people have to regulate their own physical capacities. And uh, this separation was uh, confirmed by our analysis of branching within neurochemistry, neurochemical systems regulating the behavior. And of course, uh, emotionality uh, uh, traits, which are basically emotional amplifier of all these three. Um, context, uh, uh, dynamical features of behavior. Uh, to just point out that if you want to reason about neurochemistry or polymacy or neurochemistry or creativity, please pay attention that emotional traits are not related to one means like serotonin or dopamine, but rather related to mirror receptors. And this is uh, important so later in our talk, I'm going to mention that emotionality traits probably um, have specific pattern in polymacy. Now, uh, if you want to understand neuroscientifically how everything works, uh, our suggestion is that we need to uh, present anything consistent in our behavior, any consistent traits, as a relationship between several forces. There's no one-to-one -one correspondence between one neurochemical system and one trait, but relationships are consistent. And uh, we can derive the traits uh, just from this kind of uh, relationship between couples or trios of uh, neurotransmitters, hormones, neuropeptides, or pivot receptors. Uh, we have uh, a model with uh, 12 components, and of course we have a test which is free for use in 20 languages online on the web. And these are the traits. As you see, you don't need to know neurochemistry. The traits are all recognizable. You, you heard about it. You understand the definition, right? You can just go ahead and use the test without worrying about all this neurochemistry. However, if down the road, if you want to conduct more neurophysiological studies, you are here, you know what's happening. So, um, okay. So how about if we just speculate what the uh, creativity and polymacy is? Well, first of all, um, I suggested yesterday that creativity can be presented as mostly a regulation in this part of our neurochemistry. And uh, if you go there chemically, it's probably more related to the dopaminergic networks. Um, that's how 
creativity portrait or profile looks like. And as you see, mostly it is integration, speed of integration traits. It's how people uh, choose alternatives, behavioral alternatives, and put it together. And these traits are actually not studied in personality research because they're off the social radar. And that's why the big five failed. In big five, they don't have it. It's a problem with the pro-social bias of the moment. But if you go from biomarkers, you can say that these traits are really biologically based. So the creativity is, in general, is the ability to put together a program of actions and execute the program of actions. And creativity is supported by more or less uh, approval, the uh, disposition or emotional disposition for approval of the actions, called positive emotional actions in uh, common language. What about polymacy? Polymacy is actually a little bit different than creativity. It seems like polymacy has more power to cortical traits. I'm going to talk about all the three traits. Just mark here one, but I'm going to talk about the second as well. And um, still have this kind of special regulation of delta and neuropeer receptors related to this two traits, impulsivity and satisfaction. And it's very important to note that uh, in childhood, how this polymycin can show up, like ADHD. In child, people have struggling, uh, or st are struggling with uh, school assignments for school discipline, because everything attracts them. So they can be labeled as impulsivity or kind of attention deficit, because they learn what teacher has to offer very fast, because they contextually they arise and develop, so they get the sense of probabilistic thinking quite fast, and they get distracted by something else. So it's very uh, touchy subject here. Are polymers actually happy people or not? But they, they don't mind being punished because they have this dispositional positive mood, and they say, oh well, okay, I got punished, oh well, I can go away. And they just satisfied with uh, themselves as it is. But the uh, important part is that in, in comparison to creativity, polymacy suffer from low ability to do habitual work, to do autom uh, automatic work, to do routine stuff, to work on a conveyor, to dig the gardens, something repetitive, something stereotype. That's where polymacy kind of fail, and that's why they often don't fit. They don't, don't fit social demands, not just because they know more, they want to learn more, and people uh, stop them. Nobody stops them. They sometimes don't feel social settings because um, they just can't perform routine elements of the job. And that's why they don't stay at the job. They don't exactly make money the way how other people make money. Anyway, uh, so let's talk about um, first uh, uh, cortical component, this probabilistic processing. And it's uh, our scientific way to describe how neuroanatomically or neurochemically everything is happening in terms of information processing. It's the uh, ability of an individual to capture the frequency of events and to highlight what is exceptional, what is common, what are the rules, what are the causes, what are the consequences. And uh, uh, this trait was actually uh, described in temperament research uh, in 20th century field by Jung. If you know that his concept of introversion differed from the concept of introversion proposed by Isaac. And uh, Jung specifically defined it as orientation to internal thinking, to internal probabilistic processing. A similar idea was proposed in the research of uh, abilities, especially intelligence. Uh, by Gauss, Galton, Stern, Raven, and so on. They coined the idea of the word endurance, so basically educating themselves. So these people have higher learning abilities. Why do they have higher learning abilities? Because they have wider context of probabilities, of probabilities around them. And in this mapping probabilities, they are much more proficient than other kids or other individuals. And um, importantly, when they go with the speed of integration, remember we, we have plasticity, common trait for all crazy people. Uh, they have probably more alternatives to take care of 
So when they're choosing the alternatives, you know, this is important, I'm going to do this, this is important, I'm going to do this, and we suppress 99.9% .9 of any other behavioral alternatives or perceptual alternatives. In comparison to other people, including creative people, only mass people don't suppress everything 99.9%, .9 they probably suppress 99.7%. So they keep kind of extra 2% running in the mind and pay, paying attention to and then exploring it. So they have ad, uh, additional alternatives in their behavior. Um, the, the sensitivity to probability, so probability processing, is not sensation or risk seeking or opening to experience. Uh, opening to experience is very messy. Any, any traits in big five is kind of messy definitions because they mixed up social and biological factors. But if you go from neuroscience point of view, it's probably better to use the term probabilistic processing. Then you actually can measure and you can have significant results. Um, we can argue that probabilistic processing is a temperament trait. Why? Because it uh, meets all the criteria of temperament traits, such as uh, neurochemical nature, temperament by default is the chemical systems, so uh, it's uh, proven that uh, probabilistic processing will link to uh, the action of neurodegenerative dopamine systems, and uh, this um, individual differences related to probabilistic processing were found in very early infants. That's another uh, definition of uh, temperament trait. Uh, that the trait should be found in pre-cultural individuals, and that's indeed what happened. Uh, they found it in early infants, in two years old, in five years old, in animals. And uh, it's stable over time and uh, over lifetime, and it has a distinct dynamical patterns because temperament relates to dynamical features, how long, how fast the switch comments, uh, behavioral irritation, uh, emotional reactivity. So this actually uh, relates to uh, temperament traits as well. Now, the second component that I want to discuss is uh, so-called intellectual endurance or uh, sustained tension. Sometimes people call it effortful control. And uh, it's important to remember that polymacy is not just about the wits, it's not about just spectrum of the interest. It's about, as Mike said, ability to complete the assignments. And I just returned from London from an uh, interesting workshop that British Library put together in um, uh, memory of 500 years death from uh, this of Leonardo da Vinci, here's a pin, here's a slide, and you guys have it, so I have two items, and you have only two, you have slides, and I didn't have a, a tie, so we each, we each have some kind of stuff from Leonardo. But I just want to point, he has very extensive notebooks, and you know how he did it, uh -huh. you know how he did it. He sketched it by uh, some kind of pencil or chalk, etc., etc., and it wouldn't stay. But he bought rather expensive papers, that's why his notes are so condensed with different fields. And uh, he used special uh, moisturizing, watering stuff to prepare the paper with a metal pin just to make the almost engraving. And then he used special ink to put the stuff above this engraving. So this is really very painful work. And it's a lot of notebooks like this. So if you are devoted to science, you can do it, but you really need a lot of sustained function. You really need a lot of ability to stay on the task. So this is very important thing, as the core systems and other systems. And uh, they are proven to be um, uh, temperament traits as well because uh, uh, they, of course, well studied uh, in temperament research, and uh, they relate to neurochemical systems, they found in pre-cultural individuals, stable over time, and have distinct uh, dynamical patterns. So now we can see that uh, polymacy can be presented as these three components plus these two components. And this is a phase of polymacy. If anybody wants to screen guys uh, at school, for example, or 
uh, in adulthood um, and link it somehow to neuroscience, just use our test. It's uh, just two pages very compact things. And you might see the profile uh, in this five traits, really distinct signature of polymers. But now, of course, we can go and uh, 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 speculate about types of polymers and uh, do it in a rising neuroscientific way. And uh, first of all, we can, yeah, sorry, yeah, in scientific way and combine it with just each of these traits. So we can pre uh, uh, imagine at least seven types of different polymassy people. But this way, typology comes more from science than from just observations. Now I want to link it to previous presenters, and I want to see the resemblance to what uh, Dean was talking about. Uh, he talked about versatility, and versatility probably relates to this dynamical feature of behavior when we have expansion opportunities. Then he talked is as integration of well-learned knowledge, right? So integration comes in this column, and well-learned knowledge it comes from this column. So we have uh, a consensus on this topic. And uh, if we uh, look at what Mike was talking about, he also used these three um, parameters of these three aspects of polymers. And the same with. Uh, 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 with his studies, he studied our uh, he studied his sample using our test on uh, Brazilian sample, and uh, um, the test was validated for 30 years already. And uh, the test is available in PDF and Excel format. Excel is very fast processing, and uh, he noted uh, he just uh, put together the slide. But I want to show you that his test uh, results really. Um, correspond to our hypothesis about polymacy. And uh, indeed, these three traits relate to polymacy, but depth more relates to uh, uh, probability processing, breadth relates to uh, plasticity, and what a variation is, uh, I'm not so sure he can say. <laughs> and uh, the fi finally, there is a correspondence to what Angela reported from, his, uh, from her sample, uh, uh, saying that, uh, first of all, uh, they kind of not behaving as narrow specialists. Yes, they can't sustain this one uh, type of activity. They really have these multiple alternatives. But uh, they're experts across disciplines, and they really are very attentive to their tasks. So here's a summary, and I think I'm uh, off time there. OK, thank you very so much. So I would like to begin by commending the panel organizer, Michael Rocky, for assembling such a diverse set of scholars at work on the same phenomenon. The result is a fascinating concatenation of knowledge in the making. What do we want to know about polymathy and why? What is it we hope to learn from these various fields? As today's panel makes clear, we can assess certain aspects of behavior we deem polymathic with some degree of scientific rigor. We could determine the incidence uh, over time the poly and look at polymathy as a cogent strategy through history. We can at the same time appreciate the lived experience of the polymath as opposed to the specialist, say, or the dilettante. And we can try to figure out how best to support and utilize polymathy in social environments. We can situate the polymathic strategy within a broader philosophical, this historical understanding of creativity, or even the worldview of civilization. We can ask what may be learned from the study of biochemical processes in the brain, 
and to what effect they may have on the socio-cultural aspects of mind. We are, I would submit, at an interesting crossroads in the study of polymathy, at a traffic circle, really, with the potential to integrate the intellectual activity of history, philosophy, psychology, and more into the broad field of creativity studies. The panel raises many questions of import, and I'd like to focus my brief remarks on just a few and then leave Bob time for his thoughts and summation. So first question, of course, is what is polymathy? What aspects of the phenomenon are we interested in? And our speakers have articulated an interesting range of definitional approaches. Polymathy entails three core elements, breadth, depth, and integration. Integration involving the capacity of connecting or synthesizing different conceptual networks with implications both personal and intellectual. Another definition, achieved eminence in more than one domain or subdomain. And of course, the lived experience of an intellectual outsider shaped by idiosyncratic self-directed learning to forge a non-traditional career path and all the socio-personal difficulty and benefit that that entails. So my question is, can we integrate these working definitions? Can we at least follow their lead to further questions? What, for instance, is the relationship between breadth of learning and productive outcome, or more specifically, creative productivity? There are sure to be many answers, but here's one possibility. If we understand creative problem solving as the integration of two or more previously unrelated ideas, methods, concepts, principles, techniques, or materials, relating them in a novel, effective, and surprising manner, it is not possible to be creative without being in some measure polymathic, that is to say, exposed and immersed to two or more unrelated modes of knowing and doing. Another question. Where do we place the bar for impact? At personal levels, public levels, or historical levels of creativity? Eminent achievement in multiple disciplines or disparate levels of achievement in multiple disciplines? If we define creative polymathy as, quote, the active rather than productive or publicly creative engagement in multiple interests or endeavors that draw upon or synthesize vocations and avocations simultaneously or serially across the lifetime, then we can target avocational as well as vocational endeavor. We can consider creative activity of varying levels of impact insofar as they integrate with and contribute to an individual's creative achievement in some public arena of knowledge or culture. That is, I believe, a move in the direction of definitional integration, and something more. In my estimation, this is where my personal research comes in, in a way, in my estimation, there is an, an advantage in avocational polymathy, and how we deal with the amateur avocation and its role in vocational productivity can open up our inquiries in ways that invite very polymathic integration, the very polymathic integration we would study which raises the question, and the question I want to integrate in here. So how do polymaths come by their integrative ability? This is where I believe that the cognitive and neurochemical studies may have some influence. I also think we need to do close study of a whole range, the whole range of a person's network of interests, including their avocations, and how those inter in interests interact over time. So to that end, to sort of kickstart the study of that integration using avocations, I might ask Dean, how does one rate Beatrix Potter for this versatility? Beatrix Potter was a contrarian amateur mycologist who became a professional illustrator and author of children's books and a conservation pioneer. And I might ask Michael, where do we place Tolkien in the modeling of breadth, depth, and integration. Given the very fluid nature of these categories, he was largely conventional in his profession, 
creative in his highly integrated avocation, which in effect became then his vocation. And I might ask Angela, how does Wislava Zimborska's choice to remain an amateur, to remain marginal in her visual art and not pursue expertise, as in her Nobel Prize winning poetry, how does that reflect on her identity, her polymathic identity? And to what extent might outsider, at, uh, outsider status be chosen and why? And in general, I might just ask, uh, what do we make of someone like Herb Simon, a vocational polymath in multiple domains, economics, political science, cognitive science, he won the Nobel Prize in Economics for work in decision making, which was the fruit, in his own estimation, of every one of his interests. In fact, he said he could justify any hobby um, as research, and that sometimes he had to cut them out because they were taking up too much time, but they were research to him as well as anything else. So answers to these and other questions about avocations demand attention to qualitative as well as quantitative evidence to the lived experience as well as cultural impacts in and on polymathy. That's one line of research. There are many, and I hope that some of it, those many have become obvious to us here today, and I'm sure Bob will be touching on some more of that. I just wanted to end my remarks with the thought that um, we need a polymathic approach to the problem of creative problem, uh, to the problem of creative polymathy. And that's the only way we're going to reach some resilient answers about how we can use polymathy and how it can lead us forward. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Blue Bernstein. Um, I'm the ultimate imposter here because I'm actually a professor of physiology, not uh, psychology. This is my hobby, if you will, and half my work is actually now a collaboration with a professional artist. Uh, the other half that I don't do with Michelle. So I know exactly what Angela was talking about when she talked about the imposter uh, idea coming up in a lot of her people. Um, and that leads to me to want to address some of the relationships between being an outsider uh, and being creative, which is one of the themes I think we've got here. Uh, lots of people talk about getting outside the box to be creative. Uh, I actually don't like that analogy, and this is something I think we need to th think about seriously as we go forward in polymathy studies. Um, I don't feel like I, anybody can actually get outside their box. They can enlarge their box. Uh, I sit in many boxes, but I spend a lot of time, and this gets to Michael's issue of integration, I spend a lot of time trying to get my boxes to actually be one house. It's like, you know, <laughs> you can be in many different houses, or you can be in one mansion. And I'm trying to get that mansion effect by putting everything together. So. How do we think about creativity? Is it thinking outside the box, or is it enlarging your box, or is it combining boxes, or those kinds of things? Which leads to my next issue. What boxes do we count? So everybody's been talking about Leonardo. There is an aspect of his life that gets overlooked in virtually every biography I've seen, but it's absolutely critical to his life. And that was he made his first big impression at court and got his first people to actually invest in him as a juggler, dancer, singer, and gymnast. Okay, that's usually not on the list of all these other wonderful things he did. So he was an extremely talented physical individual, which we haven't talked about here at all. Now, one of the things Michelle and I keep running across, we just finished a huge study of every Nobel Prize winner and whether they're polymathic, is a huge number of them were very highly trained and very successful athletes. Some of them even competed in the Olympics. There are a few people out there who got Olympic medals. Does that count as by polymathic? That raises the further issue of thinking. 
what do we include when we're talking about integrative thinking and coming up with ideas. Howard Gardner and we have very different ideas about body thinking, but body thinking comes up in both of our sets of work as being really a critical way of knowing. So how do we go about, if we think body thinking is critical, capturing ability in this area and how do we include it in polygraph? Because none of the studies that have been done so far have included that. That's not something people uh, you know, put in the Encyclopedia Britannica or whatever else that we're looking at. So a lot of the studies, people may be more polygraphic than we think so. Dean Simon's work is you know, fantastic. We've looked at it. He's got great statistics. But I bet people are even more polygraphic than we think they are from those studies. And we should probably go back and actually start rethinking some of those. All right, another interesting issue here is process versus product. And so this goes back to philosophy. Heraclitus you mentioned versus Pythagoras, but he also had this tremendous debate with Democritus. And so Democritus is the world's made up of you know, atoms, which is the way we tend to look at things today. Um, however, Heraclitus said, no, in fact, the real things that are happening are all processes. Probably it's both. But I think that also addresses, again, Dean's issue of versatility versus polymath. Because versatility seems to me to be what you input into the system, the learning you get, the talents you develop, your knowledge, all those kinds of things, in order to have the potential to be what you are defining as polymathic which is a product, it's, I mean, you were measuring it as something you get out at the end. So in some ways, we're gonna to have to, in this field, figure out what's the relationship between the process by which you get to being a polymath. And that talks somewhat to Dr. Trofimova's ideas about, is this personality, is it a brain chemistry issue, is it something you're born with, is it something you develop, um, is this innate, is it whatever. Okay, so these are all issues we're going to have to figure out. So again, what are our measurements? Are there measurements of processes, which is quite different, I think, than what most of us have been doing, or is it measurements of outputs? All right, um, just some other, I think, fairly important issues and questions that maybe haven't been raised to give you some idea of what the possibilities are in the field. Um, we really don't know whether polymathy is innate or whether it's learned. Now, probably it's both. Um, Angela's work seems to suggest people sort of knew that they were polymathic from the beginning. Um, but I know lots of people who have lots of talents. Did they not become a polymath because they didn't have the opportunity? That something didn't allow them to put everything together? Um, because they were encouraged at some point because they're a really good musician, just do that because that'll make you successful. So drop the rest. Um, when we look at polymaths over lifetimes, is there a particular period of time that you have to get in? Is this like language acquisition? You don't have this key thing where there's a key set of events occurring. Uh, you just don't get that language. It's going to be much more difficult for you to become a polymath. Uh, big questions we don't understand at this point. Um, and then getting back to, again, one of the issues that, that Dean raised in, in effect in his keynote last night, and then again uh, by implication today, uh, what's the relationship between all these and creativity? I think last night Dean we talked about there's a combinatorial issue, sort of the point that Michelle made, that you need to be able to put things that weren't put together before. Um, do you try many different things? How many different things do you try before you get something that's really interesting? Flip side of that is we've seen that many people who are very creative actually raise problems. So here's another side to all of this, is your probability of finding a really interesting problem or a new challenge that nobody else has seen before increased by having this versatile or polymathic background uh, versus simply being in one box. All right. Uh, lots of questions, lots of potential, lots of very interesting things that are raised, and I think a lot of this comes out of the beauty of having four different approaches and then comparing what each one leaves out or raises compared to the other ones 
and the opportunities here are just tremendous. So I hope you've all had a great time, learned a lot, and I think we're going to open it up for questions because we have some time, right? So uh, thank you. Questions? Me? Yeah. I think it was the starting talking about a very interesting topic. So uh, the uh, whole time I struggled a little bit. Because if we want to talk about uh, polymathing or facility, whatever, we cannot avoid the definition of domains. But if we look at this uh, topic, I'm a, a, a bit confused. Uh, because uh, just now, uh, Professor Simonton has mentioned in his slides, uh, one slide uh, 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 that uh, wrote about four domains, and the other one uh, from Carson Draw is that seven domains. And I remember in 2004, Vice in article suggested seven domains. And then uh, in the widely uh, used questionnaire from Carson and colleague, uh, the critique achievement questionnaire, they proposed 10 domains. Kaufman has four domains, <laughs> so they were not <laughs> lost. I want you to, have to come here. know, are there any consensus in terms of domains? No. How to define <laughs> the domains of the domains? Short answers, no. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, uh, my own answer, of course. Uh, you know, the domains are growing as professional life of people are growing. The number of professions shows up and shows up and grows and grows and grows as humanity develops. For example, now we can have uh, quite gifted uh, polymers who tried computer sciences and modeling something uh, using the computer language. Uh, two, 500 years ago, this polymers wouldn't do it. Uh, Leonardo, when he started, uh, we are saying, oh, he was uh, excelled in uh, uh, painting, and also he was excelled as a doctor, uh, knowing all this uh, neuroanatomy, etc., etc., or sorry, anatomy of the body, and he excelled in uh, some sciences, etc. Guess what? At that point, all artists studied muscles. Michelangelo studied muscles. It was common for them to study uh, insides of the body. To picture the body quite sharply. So back then it was one profession. Now we consider it like two completely different professions. So my point is the division between domains will be fluid, will be more changing, and the number of domains will grow and grow and grow. So we better don't stick with specific kind of definitions of domains, but I, I guess it's probably like common sense to feel that yeah, it's a little bit different domain. But I like a uh, distinction between intra-disciplinary uh, uh, polymacy and uh, in, 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 in tech, right? So, for example, if uh, you are in psychology, right, and if you studied cognitive psychology, clinical psychology, blah, 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 many types of psychology, you are intra-polymacy, uh, intra, intra, intra right? So it's kind of different domains. Uh, but uh, if you study psychology plus physics plus whatever, then it's different disciplines. So I guess let's follow with the word disciplines. Disciplines a little bit. Disciplines change, and we just follow the divisions. But I don't think there is a clear cut and objective, universal measures that will stay forever. But we still need sort of some framework that we know that it's really polymathy because it's across domains and disciplines. Yeah, but that's the issue that Robert brought. So which size of the box? How to divide the box? Yeah, it's not it's not consensual. Yeah. Um, one, <laughs> one way of looking at this, like the, the difference between uh, interdomain and interdomain, is um, you know all domains require the acquisition of expertise. The question is is how much positive transfer you get in a particular expertise when you move from one domain to another domain. Okay. Clearly, in the time of Shakespeare, where plays were written in poetry, uh, like first, um, there's a lot of transfer over his writing poetry and over and his writing plays. Maybe since some of his poems were actually quite dramatic. Okay, um, and if he were to write a novel, of course, novels didn't exist in English literature then. They, we're already invented in Japan, but that's it. not going to help them. Um, if if he wanted to write a novel, or take you know a later period like uh, Thomas Hardy, uh, who started out as a novelist and then became a poet, 
there's not as much positive transfer. You have to actually learn a new body of techniques to write poetry versus writing a novel. So to me, this gets back to this fluid idea, there's actually kind of a, an implicit quantitative measure here um, of how much positive transfer you have in the expertise that you acquire. I mean, obviously, for example, in literature, you have to have a massive vocabulary, flexible vocabulary. And so in that respect, writing novels and writing poetry have a lot of overlap in their expertise. But uh, learning all the rhythm techniques, you know, rhythmic techniques and um, rhyme schemes and so forth, these formal structures are very, very different. So. Okay, just uh, one point. But even within the same domain, for example, in music, we have Beethoven and we have like Yo-Yo Ma. One is a composer and the other is a performer within the same domain. And the, I think the transfer is much different from performers to creators. So yeah. there is a problem inside of a problem. So, so sorry. Can we, sorry, can we roughly decide it into science and arts? That's why I'm always studying science and arts. Yeah. 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 Ye
and I think we're talking in my session that I feel like polymathic and I don't fit anywhere, but I just don't really make it fit. And just like Bob said, they, they look like one to me. At some level, I look at the, the tetrahedron and I don't see them as separate. Sure. But I'm also wanting to comment on Elena's point. I think in your matrix, it seems like the, the, the polymaths have some two or three dimensions in the top row and a couple in the bottom. And the social in the, for the third row is completely missing. Because they don't Please. differ. They yeah. don't have anything specific. They're missing because they don't have like signature. B. They can be social, they can be not very social, they can be physical, can be not physical. So it doesn't differentiate them from, from they come with different types. Go with the way. Yeah. One yeah. more? Uh, yes, I just like to, to point one thing. Maybe I can help you on that. I've been running a polymathic association. Michael is being, it's not necessary. Michael is mentoring us over there. And until now, we have found, found out that you can roughly split those um, um, domains into 13 different, and you can split some discipline, all the disciplines inside it. But it's just useful when you're finding a way of helping someone to locate him or herself in the beginning of the process, and you have to divide this between interest into the film. Once you have find this person to develop, to locate himself, and we use Irina's material in order to help him to, to, to find the process as well, they naturally go and they start to cross the boundaries. So the boundaries, when you talk about developing, it's totally different. And I can point you, for instance, there's a new domain Call, 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 uh, um, call it transversal, but regarding to build words. What mean build words? Someone, for instance, do, that makes video games, build vi video games, for the nature of the domain itself has to be polymath because he or she has to combine math, logic, and some uh, reading and some really creative uh, regarding as artistic development. So the nature of the disciplines that goes into this specific domain uh, allows people from since the beginning to start this way. So 13 domains, it is okay, but just in the beginning of the process. Okay, thank you everybody. We have a notebook if you want material from us. We have time. One question, and I, this construct is new to me, and the one thing that I am struggling the most with is not the breadth of these domains, but how does one measure the difference between an interest and the expertise? I mean, there's such a huge continuum there. At what point does it truly become that, that you have that, whatever characteristic is, say, I'm a writer, but I do pottery. I mean, if I do it on the side and as a hobby, does that qualify me as a polymath? Or do I have to attain a certain level of expertise? And then how do you measure that? That's a good question. I think it's continuing. Yeah, I think it's continuing. My, my, my answer would be it's continuing. You're right. And we Michelle? just need to do qualitative. Do you want to read it? Michelle, it's a few trends. I'd say you don't really have to worry too much. So would be my response. You don't have to worry too much about whether you're an expert. What really matters in the end is whether, say, for your array of interests and your network of enterprise, and you've got something that you're working on that's a, a creative a creative product that other people will say, yes, that's a creative achievement of some sort. Um, and you know, to get there, to get to that creative achievement, you've had to use maybe your pottery, something you understand from pottery or something you understand from an application and that fed into you know, some insight you had that, that allowed you then to make a vocational contribution. So it doesn't matter whether you're an expert in that pottery or not, if you got an idea from it. I mean, I also think, uh, for instance, I was just thinking of an example, Louise Nevelson um, took Eurythmics for like 20 years. She wasn't an expert in it. She just did it for you know exercise and whatever, um, and because she loved the dance aspect of it or whatever it was. She never went on to try to be professionally an expert in Eurythmics. And yet the Eurythmics finally fed into, um, when she was exploring all these different art forms, how could she find the art that, was, that she could be creative at? She finally you know, made her breakthrough in sculpture. And the sculpture is very heavily influenced by that Eurythmics. So for her, and that's why I was saying you really need to study at an individual level, you have to understand 
person's network of interests and how they're feeding into each other. And that's what really matters, not whether someone would label them expert or non-expert. I have a kind of a, a brief kind of operational definition to answer your question. Um, there's a very interesting scale that was developed for creativity, which is um, designed to assess actual achievement, but also go down to lower levels, like interests, and even no interests, okay? And uh, it's called the, the Creative Achievement Questionnaire. Uh, it's widely used, it's called the CAQ, uh, and the Creative uh, Achievement Questionnaire looks at multiple domains, including domains that don't necessarily you think you would not think associated with creativity, like sports and entrepreneurship, for example, and culinary arts, okay? It's got, I uh, forget how, how many different areas, but like a dozen or more. And if each one scale starts at zero, like I just don't give a damn about this field, all right? And then moves up to, well, you know, I, I watch a play from time to time. And, then, and it just kind of moves up until you acquire a competence in the area. And then you actually have won local awards for your recipes and then finally national awards. And you actually produce products and so forth. And it wasn't designed to be a versatility or polymathy measure, but that's actually what it is. Someone who got a high score on all those scales in the polymath, by definition. Yes. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for coming. There is a notebook here, my notebook, so I can send you the materials if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, let's take a picture. Oh. Ding, 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 don't bother oh. me. Let's take a picture. Where's, where's Michael?